The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. This webinar will begin shortly. Hi and welcome back to Eurostar Huddle. This is a new webinar and um, we thank you for being with us here today. This webinar is with Matthias and he is from Accenture. The webinar is called Developing a Quality Engineering Workforce. We have another webinar next month. You can register for that webinar over on our Huddle site if you haven't done so already. If you would like to ask Matthias a question at any time during this webinar, please do so in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. The question and, the question and answers will be held at the very end of this webinar. Matthias, I will give you control of the screen. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Matthias. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, thank you uh, for the uh, introduction and welcome to everybody uh, joining this uh, webinar. Um, my pleasure to host the session for you today. Um, we'll be talking about uh, quality engineering in, in broader terms, but specifically about the people aspect. Um, a little bit to myself. Um, as uh, mentioned, I'm uh, from Accenture, I actually lead our testing domain um, within the Austria, Switzerland, Germany market. Uh, I've been doing this for, for quite a while, started as a manual tester, uh, went into technical testing, performance testing, and then more and more into test strategy, process improvement, assessment strategy type of work. Um, uh, outside of uh, Accenture, I'm also a part of the Team MI Foundation. Um, some of you might be familiar with Team MI as a process a reference model, a process maturity model, with which you can conduct um, test assessments. I'm the technical chair there, um, where I'm responsible for model development and for uh, different aspects um, of the model. And one of the things that we're talking about there is also how do all the new developments like Agile and DevOps and gaming and so on actually feed into the process? Um, because obviously most of the testing processes that we know um, have been developed from an uh, you know, older batch of, of processes still in the waterfall world. And um, how do we actually adapt these processes is one of the, the key changes. Now, one of the important things um, is that the, the world obviously is evolving. What you see in front of you now um, are five key components of what we call the Accenture technology vision. 
Every year, the Accenture Technology Labs uh, publishes a research report that uh, doesn't really look at uh, the world today, but looks at the world in five to 10 years to say, okay, what is really happening out there? And how does the state of technology really change? I urge you to, to download that report. It's really interesting, especially if you take a look at some of the previous things. And um, one of the recurring themes was always, how does technology actually impact um, people? So, for example, two years ago, we had the theme of reimagining the workforce and to go more towards a more agile, more dynamic workforce. This year, one of the key topics this year is number five is the borderless organization. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you look at the other uh, themes, uh, we have topics like applied analytics. So on the one hand, there was a lot of talk in the previous years about how data transformed the industry, how data transforms everything that we do. How do we actually harvest the data, analyze that data, and then use that data? Now it's about uh, the analytics behind that. How do we actually apply that? A lot of talk has been um, around um, analytics, and a lot of usage has been um, already given to analytics, but now it's the application of that. And uh, if you look at the quality engineering space, it's really how do we use analytics, how do we use insights, um, that can be, can be from machine learning, from deep learning, from AI, for the quality uh, characteristics that we're after. Yeah, so that would be one way of looking at this. Beyond DevOps, obviously, means that DevOps is well established already across many different technology stacks, among across many different organizations. But what's actually next? Uh, some people are already talking about DevSecOps, yeah, which then inserts the security aspects. Uh, to make sure that during the development, during the individual sprints, we think about security. Some people talk about biz DevOps yeah, to make sure that as we do an Agile already, we have a very strong product owner who's integrated into the teams, whereas DevOps is really more the agglomeration of uh, development operations. So why not include develop, uh, business in there as well yeah, to, to even further topics? Yeah, so that's one way of looking, uh, of looking at transformation. Topic number three is all around uh, artificial intelligence, but uh, here really um, things that are driven by AI. So not so much applications that use AI to come to, to some results, but how, again, do we use AI in this context, monitoring integration to come up uh, with better solutions? Yeah, there have been a lot of um, discussions, a lot of implementations of predictive operations, for example, where the systems can learn. We have seen that in the transportation industry, for example, data harvested from trucks is then being used to be able to tell both the transportation provider, but also the tire manufacturer, for example, that something needs to happen relatively soon. So how do we use those insights and how do we go from machine learning to really AI uh, topics? Um, fourth point is around self-managing, and self-managing not so much in the sense of the work that we do, uh, but in uh, the applications uh, that we have. Now, so how do we use AI and machine learning uh, to actually teach our applications that they can uh, manage their own ecosystem? These four topics are really about the, the next state of technology. There's a lot more detail in the technology vision, but what I wanted to touch upon today is the borderless organization. So how does all of this impact us? If you look at the, the state of technology today, um, you can probably argue that all of our lives are constantly being touched uh, by technology, whether it's our smartphone waking us up, you know, whether it's if you have a smart coffee maker that then automatically you know, does your coffee the way you like it at exactly the right uh, point in time, whether it's your electronic uh, key lock, whether it's a diagnostic system in your car that constantly uh, monitors that, whether it's the car insurance that uses the, that data to actually give you a little bit of a rebate if you're driving the way they want you to drive. All of those things are um, quite intrusive on the one hand, quite invasive, but on the other hand, we can't really imagine living without that. I have five kids, for example, the oldest one's 17, and uh, I don't see her living without her smartphone anymore. Uh, she does more or less everything but with what we would do previously. We would pick up a newspaper to take a look at the cinema. We would um, you know, simply talk to people to find things out, and uh, her smartphone gives her all of that. And uh, with my youngest son, who just turned one year old, I'm sure it will be a lot more invasive. So 
what does that actually mean uh, for the people that we have in our workforce? What does that actually mean if we look at our organizations? Uh, for example, in my domain, we have 450 people who we recruit as quality engineers, who we recruit as testers, and we want to grow yeah, to boards all the way to the managing director level in this quality space. How do we make sure they actually have the right uh, career? And how do I then actually within my domain make sure I have the right skills the right tasks for people and the right role descriptions in there. One of the important things of the borderless organization is that um, we talk about uh, the four Bs. Uh, we talk about, uh, if you look at your workforce, that you can either build your skills, you can borrow them, uh, you can bot them, or you can simply buy them. So similar to applications where you have a make or buy decision, in the future we see a strong tendency to be a lot more uh, dynamic and hence the borderless uh, synonym in here that talks about take a look at all the activities that are within your organization and really choose where is your best interest. Do you want to build those skills internally? Do you simply want to borrow them from the market? Do you want to buy them either in terms of uh, automation, for example, where you don't need that anymore or in terms of external uh, contingents? Or can you simply bought them, which means can you replace them with RPA or with any other um, means uh, that is necessary? This means if we look forward, what we call intelligent automation is really touching a lot of um, people topics. On the one hand, digital technologies are really changing the way we work. Yeah, whether it's uh, your usage of a Skype call and you have a screen share, which means you don't really need to travel all that often um, for meetings anymore, or whether it's uh, your usage of robotic process automation so that you can get rid of some of the mundane tasks, or whether it means that you apply some AI and machine learning into that RPA so that it already tells you uh, that things uh, might go wrong within your supply chain. This is really changing the way we work. And then the first instance of that we've seen a couple of years ago when big data was all the hype, and a lot of people were running around with grand titles like a data scientist now, you know, or chief data officer. Yeah. The roles that we simply didn't have before because there was simply relatively little necessity for that outside of the academic uh, communities. So all of a sudden, because of the technology changes, we have new roles, we have a new IT work tasks. This also means we need to shift the IT workforce, similar to the uh, mechanical to the industrial revolution, we see the same thing happening with artificial intelligence, which means we go away from the actual human labor, putting that into uh, the basics, putting that into repetitive work, and really using the human brain and using, using human labor to apply thought uh, to the whole process, to really think about what this means. Uh, and with, with what this means, if you look at any manufacturing company, there will be a lot of robots in there, but you still have very well-trained engineers. Of course, you don't have as many um, as before, but I heard an example of the German steel industry, for example, where they said the output of the German steel industry is basically the same than it was 30 years ago, but we have a tenth of the workforce now only, yeah, with all the innovation that's going on, which means the jobs need to shift somewhere else, and the workforce then needs to shift to the more intelligent areas. And then finally, these two things, the fact that we're redefining IT work and that we're seeing a shift in our workforce, what we demand from our workforce means we need to reskill and we need to reskill at scale. It's not enough to offer your employees a course, a training, a certification and see who wants to do that. No, we believe um, that we really need to uh, shift and reskill at scale. Let me take you through uh, five specific topics and uh, give you some insights of what we've seen when we're working with organizations, but also some lessons learned and ideas from uh, reskilling the Accenture workforce, because obviously we're a large bunch of people and the world doesn't stand still for us either. So we'll talk about the tasks, which means we'll talk about what are the things that you're actually doing, how are they changing, what do we need to do to adapt? We'll talk about roles. I gave you the big data example already. We'll take a look at quality engineering and what that means in terms of roles. We'll look at skills. Does everybody need to be a hardcore programmer to understand DevOps and be able to work in quality engineering or are there other uh, skills as well? We'll look at uh, staffing. So where do I actually get all of these people from for my projects? 
And finally, we'll look at the learning aspect. And this is also a big change that we see. Gone are the days of big classroom trainings uh, where you have you know, 200 pages in PowerPoint and you simply mull people through that and uh, hope that they get some of the terminology at least. And we're seeing a lot more collaborative learning strategies, a lot more self-paced learning strategies, things you can do on the fly. And that's actually how um, the next generation of, of testers and quality engineers want to learn. Uh, they don't want to, to sit somewhere and study for something. They want to be able to access the information and the knowledge in form of a tutorial, in form of a, a small web-based training that they can do whenever they want at an instant moment. And they don't want to sign up uh, for a course that then might or might not be canceled. So let's look at these uh, five topics um, specifically. When you think about the, the tasks and capabilities of a quality engineering workforce of the future, it's important to note that it's, quality engineering is not just rebranding testing because it sounds cooler. Quality engineering really means what we have started with uh, in the testing community 10, 15 years ago, shifting quality to the left-hand side of the V model when we still had that, um, is now really front and center. That's the whole purpose um, of Agile methods from a quality perspective, to get the business voice in as early as possible, to make sure a product owner is there to prioritize, to have daily standups where you can talk about uh, progress, where you can talk also about inhibitors and things that you need to change. And that's why they're retrospectives, where you not only take a look at um, everything that worked well, but you definitely take a look also at the things you need to improve in the next sprint. What we term quality engineering is really this focus across the whole development life cycle, no matter what or which development life cycle you use, whether it's agile or whether it's prototyping, whether you're in a safe style or in Kanban, doesn't really matter. But it's making sure that quality is not only present at the very beginning of these life cycles and, and ever present throughout, but it's the engineering aspect, yeah, which means data-driven, logical decisions and we can actually uh, use all the data to come up with conclusions. We can do forecasting in order to forecast the quality. If you take a look at the, the two things now uh, that evolve in the area of tasks, on the one hand human tasks will uh, be a lot more about actually defining things, designing things, and then building a platform or a framework so that the automated task can actually work. And you see some examples on the right hand side yeah, we all know test automation, whether it's UI-based automation or API-driven automation, um, whether it's unit test automation. It's a very classical example. Virtual assistants and bots will play a much larger role in the future. At Accenture, we have a quality avatar that basically does the work of a defect manager. It means the tri triaging process you know, to think about where does what need to go that does all of the escalations based on the um, ideas and based on the concepts, concepts that you have in there. And this uh, virtual assistant uses AI and uses, I wouldn't call it deep learning, but at least some machine learning algorithms to identify, for example, patterns and defects that reoccur from release to release or in different environments. I think about the same defect occurring in your SIT versus your UAT environment. And uh, the avatar would be able to pick that up and then escalate it differently than if it's a uh, completely brand new. Um, defect. Think about basic utilities. I mean, when I grew up as a tester, those were the first things that, that we did. Yeah, we scripted a little bit of SQL, maybe a little bit of PLSQL to make sure we get the, the right reports. Yeah, we used other languages to look into the queues to make sure that the system was doing what it was supposed to do. And this is, of course, not uh, gone away. Now we have frameworks, and that's where on the left-hand side you see a build automation framework build a service virtualization platform could be exactly the same thing, that we use tools to get much better information. And then finally, of course, the advanced analytics uh, topic is something that's heavily automated, where we can go into predictive uh, maintenance, we can do defect forecasting, we can do, uh, we have a lot more insights into what we're actually doing, and we can actually plug that into continuous improvement programs. Yeah, because for too long, have we uh, done assessments and we have created um, process improvement roadmaps, but then it was very difficult to actually track that. And with automation, we can track the benefits of these individual improvement steps a lot better. 
So this means we'll see a shift in the future. Yeah? And we see that at some of the uh, some of the organizations are already today, and some of the organizations are much further along the curve than others, obviously. Uh, from human tasks that are based on manual labor to human tasks where you need to define um, what to do with a particular platform, for example, with uh, human tasks in quality engineering that, that defines the strategy that talks about automation where and when instead of scripting everything. So from a task perspective, basically the same thing will happen to quality that happened with data. Instead of having a bunch of developers coding SQL, we'll have a bunch of people thinking as a data scientist. Instead of many, many DBAs, we'll have people who think about the logical model implications and use that data uh, to predict. Next up are the roles, yeah, very, very similarly. I've uh, shown you an example here of, of what kind of new roles we see out there. The important thing, and this comes uh, goes back to the borderless organization, is that um, over the past 10, 15 years, a lot of us were very busy building test centers of excellence, test centers, test center of competence, whatever you wanted to call them. Basically a shared service where you had a whole bunch of test managers, test analysts, testers, automation engineers, and so on and so on, providing a service to different business entities. And what we see more and more happening is that uh, the days of these dinosaurs are gone. That doesn't mean that the test center is dead, but that simply means the roles within that test center are shifting more uh, to dedicated um, activities and to dedicated activities within the projects, but also to some shared activities that really make sense. One of our clients, for example, dissolved the test center, and now they have six or seven core services um, only left over. For example, automation strategy, performance testing, security testing, data management and data generation, environment management. So they've kept those things yeah, that could be synonymous with what you see on the right-hand side as the automation architect. They kept those things where they really want to have a good grasp on their framework, on the tools being used, but also on the strategic direction uh, that this uh, bank is uh, going into. And everything else when it comes to the actual quality engineers, uh, when it comes to the test analysts, they've then freed up and given back to the projects. Um, so that the products have the freedom to build together their teams, uh, differentiated by what's being done within the sprint and outside of the sprint, uh, for example, was it also taking a look at the actual program. Uh, do we need release level testing across the sprint? So do we need a service coordinator for that? Or do we get a data engineer, data designer from the shared service? Or are we large enough that it makes sense for us to have our own? Or maybe we're unique enough because we have a very different data model and um, we're quite autonomous in how we're doing that. Yeah, so this picture shows that obviously this is not about rebranding the tester to a quality engineer. Yeah, the quality engineer has a specific role. Um, the way we define it, this is somebody who within the sprints takes care of all quality aspects, which means this is not only automated tests has been shown here, there's a bit abbreviated, could also, for example, participate in the code reviews could also lead the continuous testing efforts, which means um, a lot of um, the definition, what do we actually automate and what do we leave for the business integration engineer when it comes to exploratory testing. Uh, that is something that the quality engineer would do, actually then driven um, by dedicated architects. Now these roles will be uh, different uh, for the individual organizations, um, but we do see um, that there will be um, changes there. Yeah, so within Accenture, for example, we're moving away from very hard role descriptions that you're a tester, then a test analyst, then a test lead, then test manager, and this is your career progression. We're making sure that within my domain, for example, we have scrum masters, we have product owners, we have people of, of all kinds of different roles, that it's clear that we expect a certain level of skills and a certain level of competency um, for you to achieve the next career level. You don't need to be a test manager to be at a certain career level. For example, in my career, I've never actually been a test manager, funnily enough. I've moved straight from a test coordinator then into the more strategic areas. And uh, we want to model that the same because we think the future will demand that. 
Speaking about skills and competencies, you probably have seen similar competency models uh, to this one. The important thing is not that you are very, very accurately able to define whether somebody is at a proficiency level P1, P2, P3, P4. Um, we're going through that exercise regularly, um, but it's a self-assessment. Recently, Accenture has introduced a tool uh, where you're basically answering a set of questions and the tool then uses machine learning to compare that to answers from different uh, domains. And then it assigns a proficiency level. So previously we were basically just uh, picking the levels ourselves based on level descriptions. Now we have a, a small machine learning tool doing that for us, for example. And um, the important thing is that we need to realize that one thing hasn't changed. It's not only about technical skills or testing skills. Whether we talk about um, the skills that people have in a certain profession 10 years ago or now or in 10 years, there will always be different competencies. And these are the five um, elements that you see here from functional through process, culture, professional, technical competencies. And you see some of the examples in here. Uh, in some of your organizations, professional would be more the soft skill things, managing complexity, decision-making, collaboration skills, um, maybe even together with the culture things, yeah, with a growth mindset, with prudent risk-taking, yeah, but being aware of risks and a conscious decision towards risks. Most of you will have a differentiation between functional skills in our space, for example, of course, quality aspects, but also a lot of the non-functional aspects like performance, security, user experience, and so on, and then technical skills. Now, what we have learned is that this list especially in the technical space but also in the process space is uh, ever-changing whereas the culture and the professional uh, skill sets are changing much slower uh, than the other two so if you look at the the technical skills and these are just some examples when we talk about restful apis or internet of things or service virtualization five years ago this wouldn't probably been in the core set of a skill of a quality engineer and now it's front and center um, now everybody needs to know how Postman works or how um, some of the other, like rest assured, some of the other tools in that space work. And not only how they work, but you need to be able to use them within your DevOps-driven Agile lifecycle. And the process space, exactly the same. While um, techniques like test-driven development have been around uh, for a very long time and continuous integration is by now also nothing new, BDD, or a lot of other concepts are constantly evolving. And we actually need to see how do we use uh, these process aspects within our uh, projects. So how do I really use exploratory testing? Um, and uh, how do I gain that skill? Is it just by practice? Is it just by trying it out? Is it by taking classroom training or reading a book on it? Um, so these things all uh, fit together. These things all have an impact on the skills and competencies of a QE workforce of the future. And uh, if you start doing something like this for your organization, the most important thing is that this is not a one-time exercise. It's not about taking an inventory of where your people are at at the moment, when they're at a P1, P2 in any specific area. Um, but that you set this up as a continuous uh, proficiency measurement if you want to go that far. You can also set it up as a continuous skill catalog and people choose themselves. And secondly, how do you actually get people interested uh, to say this is the right thing for me? One of the key challenges that I often see is that we already have an existing workforce. And this existing workforce might not even want to go into all of these directions that the industry is taking. Uh, for example, they might be perfectly fine with running their smoke tests in a manual matter in the morning and before everybody else comes in, they come in, check the interfaces. And uh, when you then tell them, okay, look, we can automate this quite uh, easily. Okay, that's fine. But what does this person then do? Um, are there other skills out there that you can reuse? Are there other roles out there, other tasks out there? And I think this is the most important thing if you go into skills and competencies to identify not only what people are doing today, but what do they actually want to do? Yeah, so that you have a good discussion with them and you can identify areas where they can be of help. And I've seen many examples 
um, where people then uh, went into a more operations driven area. They went to the business side and because whatever they were doing uh, was automated now and they simply um, didn't want to work uh, in this space anymore. Um, and the other way around, of course, as well, yeah, that uh, when we're using more automation, more service virtualization, more AI, will attract a lot of different people than we maybe attracted 10 years ago into our domain and into our community. So the skills and competency model, there are standard models out there, industry models that you can start with. Uh, I wouldn't make it too complicated. Most important thing is use this to understand where your people are at, but more importantly, use it to understand where your people want to go to and uh, how can you actually help them with that. Point number four is then uh, closely linked to that. Uh, it's the staffing and sourcing model. Uh, so I already mentioned this briefly, the four Bs. Um, we can, for example, say, okay, all of the skills that I need to be a lean, agile organization using safe and release trains, um, I can build. I can send everybody to product owner trainings, send them to agile tester trainings, and uh, when they come back after a week or two, they'll be proficient enough. We all know that uh, this is not um, how things happen. Uh, this is will probably not be enough. It will be enough for a couple of people in your organization uh, because they will embrace it and they already have uh, the right uh, skill level to be able to embrace that, which means the building part um, is extremely relevant. But as I've shown on the slide before, it's relevant from a perspective of how flexible can we be and what roles are actually out there. Buying is something that we've um, always done. Um, important here is that uh, we see a tendency um, to, instead of just buying uh, skills for a specific task, and then doing that task and then releasing those uh, skills, those bot skills again, uh, that we want a, a transfer of those skills to the internal organization, which means the build aspect can definitely benefit from the buy aspect. And we have done a, a number of projects where we, for example, helped uh, stand up the organization, the quality engineering organization for the client. We ran it uh, for a couple of releases for a couple of years in some cases, and then allowed the client uh, to build uh, the skills uh, within their own organization and then ultimately handed it over to them. Uh, so definitely a, a thing to look out for. Um, it's not um, as an application's make or buy. This is basically build and buy and borrow and bought. All of these four things need to work together. Borrow basically means taking a very close look at the crowd testing market. Gig-based workforce uh, sounds for, to me a little bit funny, but that's probably just because I'm not a native speaker. Um, this basically means if you look at the crowd testing market, uh, you have a lot of, of providers out there where you can you know, release a couple of uh, websites, mobile applications, what have you, to be tested there. And these are concepts that you can definitely um, use for your quality model of the future. So instead of just relying on either your own existing workforce or the workforce that you uh, bought or staffed from external partners to your project, why not look at um, getting either internal crowds or external crowds to participate in your quality initiatives? And we have seen that before working quite well, especially internal um, crowds. Uh, many of you will, will have been in some kind of project where the first release went to friends and family, so to speak. Yeah, so that was basically just an extended beta test. We'll have a full uh, technical go live, but we'll only release it to friends and families and to take a look um, how do they actually react and then is this really working before we then scale it up and, and go completely to the external um, public and, and to our clients ultimately. You can do the same thing, the exact same thing for most of your projects. If you look at your organizations, you will have a lot of people who are more than happy uh, to sign up for a specific internal crowd task. And within testing, this basically means exploratory testing of new developments, whether it's an internal app or even external applications. The good thing is with an internal crowd, you can actually extend the crowd testing model also to very business domain heavy applications. Uh, so one of the common challenges to crowd testing is of course, if you have a new Sapana implementation, how do you actually get SAP FI knowledge, so financial knowledge, into your crowd? Well, if I just go to a crowd provider, 
it's going to be relatively rare that I find somebody who knows about ledgers and, and purchase orders and so on. Yeah, but of course, within your internal organization, what did we do before? We went to all of the individual countries. We asked the business departments, um, by the way, during those two weeks in December, we'll need two people from your department to help us test that. And then come December, we hope that these people were actually available and they knew about anything. If you opened this up a little bit and said, look, um, if you have, for example, financial knowledge because you work in these business processes, uh, why don't you sign up for the crowd? Every uh, now and then we'll send you invites to participate in a specific exploratory testing session. Um, and then you can contribute also to the company and to the internal uh, developments. So it's the crowd testing and the borrower aspect here is not only about external crowds, where you, for example, test a multitude of devices and platforms and make sure that works, but you can definitely also set up an internal crowd engine. And then finally, the fourth B is around bot, um, which is, something that we've uh, been trying to do all along with test automation, um, but we've been focusing for too long on the execution part of that. We built huge extensive uh, coded frameworks that uh, we then called keyword driven, which basically just meant that somebody had to code keywords and you were trying to hide the complexity from the actual people doing the work. And we're now finally seeing the expansion of that concept away from pure execution to analysis, for example, to test design, test data creation, service virtualization, and so on. So the staffing model, where do I actually not only get my skills from, but um, which areas do I need to focus on in order to get all of my tasks done of the future, will focus on four things. That's not only do I have these skills internally and can I get them from the external market, it's uh, also a strategic decision. Where do I automate? Where do I use a crowd? And where do I ultimately want to invest? So this is obviously very, very closely linked to the skills and competency model that are shown earlier, because this will then drive your decision. Where do I need to upskill my people? And uh, where, for example, do I want to automate certain tasks? And finally, reskilling and retooling um, is then the, the aspect of um, how do we learn? Now, there has been a lot of research, and I'm definitely not a psychologist, uh, far from it. I'm actually a chemical engineer by training. But for me, this is what I see on a daily basis. So how do our people want to learn? And if you take a look at this, uh, this is our research um, where we see the quality engineering workforce of the future heading. It means that we move very strongly away from formal training. So if you look at Accenture, for example, we're replacing most of our heavy classroom-based instructor-led sessions uh, with a lot shorter monthly learning sessions with learning boards, for example, um, with uh, videos, with self-help training and so on to make sure people have access to whatever they need to learn all the time. Um, we're also rotating heavily to learning from others, meaning collaborative models. This was always the strength of the, the Accenture trainings that we do internally, for example, because we rarely um, hired external trainers um, to, to do any trainings for us, relied on our own consultants, our own quality engineers to give us the training, which means um, while these were not formally trained instructors, they did have a lot of project experience and they were able to simply then share the story. So the learning from others aspect uh, was uh, pushed very strongly. Now we push that even further to take a look at rotation programs uh, so within our um, competencies, how do we rotate people with uh, monthly learning sessions? So instead of just sending out a newsletter every month, we actually create learning sessions. We have uh, challenges, we have missions. So there's a gamification aspect to this as well to make sure people actually take a look at this. But most of what we do is on the left-hand uh, side. You also see a dashboard contest, for example. We ran a challenge with one of our automation partners, Tresendus Tosca, for example. And the challenge was to, to go through a couple of their certifications. So this was a mix of you know formal training, making sure people are certified on new technology. But on the other hand, we introduced gamification and challenge aspects to that to make sure um, people are interested. And that helped a lot. Uh, it certainly helped a lot more than if you had just uh, created two classroom trainings and made sure people attended that and got certified. So the learner experience needs to shift from pure formal training 
uh, to uh, a lot more uh, self-enabled learning, learning all the time, learning at my pace when I want to actually do these things. And that is then the fifth element. That is something you carefully need to take a look at if you're thinking about how can you actually build your quality engineering workforce of the future. Now, how does this all uh, then fit together? It's nice that we have a framework. We talked about roles. We talked about skills. We talked about the organizational model. We talked about the learning aspects. But what does this actually mean uh, for you and me as an employee? One of the most interesting things is how are we actually motivated? By what are we motivated? And a lot of people will say, well, the answer is, is simple. Uh, we get paid and, and therefore uh, we're motivated. And if I get a bonus, so, so any additional benefits or maybe an external recognition, uh, my motivation will be a lot higher. But if we're honest about this, um, at least for most of us, this will not be primarily what drives us. Of course, it's, it's nice to get paid well for what you're doing. Um, but actually, if you like the people around you, um, then you know the pay is one important aspect. But if you like your senior leadership, which also means the strategic direction that you're taking, if you like your coworkers, your direct supervisor, or even your clients and partners, uh, things uh, will definitely motivate you um, to build new skills, uh, to develop into a new direction, or simply to give your best. You know, so let's not forget about that. If I think about what is it, what it, what is in it for me as an employee, it's not only the competitive rewards, you know, the pay benefits, it's also the people aspect, but there's even more. Of course, the work comes into play. Yeah, so what am I actually doing? And like I said before, we can think about automating a lot of things. Um, if it's just automating what I'm currently doing and then I don't have an alternative, but I need to use a tool now to, to do the same thing that, that I've done before manually, it's probably not going to interest me a lot. Some people will be interested by learning this tool, by automating and designing automation tasks instead of executing it manually. Others might actually cherish of the exploratory na nature of, of testing. And of course, you cannot simply automate all the tests and then believe that you will find a lot of defects. No, you need exploratory testing. Depending on the context that your project and your application is in, you might need a lot more exploratory testing than you would ever want to automate. And with that in mind, you can then take a look at work activities. You can take a look at processes and say, okay, look, so far, you've done a lot of manual testing, which means you created test cases, you executed them. Um, why don't we uh, take a look at your skills? And we realize uh, you're curious by nature. That's why you're a good tester. Why don't we move you into more um, exploratory testing and into um, agile teams where you can really then use that talent? So, of course, the, the work that we do motivates us a lot, and plus the opportunities that we get, whether these are opportunities for training and learning, uh, that motivates some of us very highly, whether it's opportunities for career advancement, or whether it's, uh, these are opportunities for mobility, so both from a geographic perspective, I'd like you know, to travel the world and be able to, to work in a lot of different places, or whether it's functional mobility, meaning Today, I'd like to work, which is of course common in the consulting profession, I'd like to work as a quality engineer in this industry. Tomorrow, I'd like to work in a different industry, um, but also in industry clients, uh, you see that uh, a lot of times, yeah, that people want to work in different areas. They don't want to be tied down to specific areas. So the opportunities you give your employees are extremely important. Um, and for some, these are, at the end, really the driving force behind uh, why they're engaged and why they want to stay with the company. For all of us, quality of life has a, a very important aspect, and this is one of the big cultural changes that we're seeing. Um, you've probably heard a lot of examples from recruiting interviews uh, where people simply said, well, it's really great, I like what you're doing, but that's not the way I want to, to live my life anymore. Yeah, you want to not only different rewards, you definitely want to have a very different work-life balance, and people are a lot more vocal about this, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing that um, people are, from a very early uh, start, already talking about this is important for me, this is the work environment I'd like to have, uh, this is the work-life balance I'd like to have, 
and therefore we need to structure our work around them. Yeah, because A, if you don't structure it around your employees, you will lose them very, very quickly. Uh, first, they get disengaged, they get demotivated, uh, they might not um, bring uh, their best to the table anymore, they might simply quit um, internally or, or outright. But uh, more importantly, you want to attract the best people to your company, to your projects, to your work, and therefore quality of life needs to be front and center of your employee engagement, of your employee value proposition. And finally, as a sixth point, it's around company practices. You know, so at Accenture, um, one of the most important metrics that we cover these days is diversity. And here we measure gender diversity simply because that's one of the more easier things to measure in diversity. We have the target of being a 50-50 company by 2025, fully acknowledging that there are not only two genders in the world, but let's stick with that. We don't need to overcomplicate things from a metrics perspective. And this metric around gender diversity is up there together with growth and profitability. So our three top metrics are exactly those, growth, growth profitability, and diversity. And this is not because um, we think it's a cool thing to do. This is because we want to open up uh, to the market. We need the best talent that we get and we cannot afford to exclude any, anybody. But more importantly, we've learned that diversity drives innovation. And innovation is exactly what you need for the quality engineering workforce of the future. And um, for some, this might um, be very, very interesting. That's exactly the type of company they might want to work for. For others, this might not be as important, yeah, similar to the company reputation or to your performance achievement process. So if you look back to the competitive rewards, how do you actually decide who gets a pay raise or how big should the pay raise be, how big should the bonus be, and things like that. Yeah, is this simply an arbitrary decision by your supervisor? Is there dedicated 360 degree feedback? There are a lot of HR consultants out there who more than happily will help you with that. At the end of the day, it's one of the cornerstones of the employee engagement of the employee value proposition. And therefore, it's good that we can think about um, reimagining the work, pivoting our workforce to the new scaling up, uh, skilling and learning programs. At the end of the day, we need to think about each and every one of our employees, of our partners, of our clients, and think, okay, how do we actually motivate them? And when it comes to quality engineering, we have a big transformation in front of us, which means we need to take a look at all of these six aspects to identify what's important for our people and how do we actually motivate them to take the step. And it can be a role change, it can be upskilling or a different learning program, it can be completely different tasks, uh, that's the, the important message for today. The quality engineering workforce for the, um, of the future is not created simply by upskilling people, by sending them to more certifications and making sure they have uh, more technical skills, for example. It means you need to reimagine work, so moving away from workforce planning, how many people do I have, what kind of capacity do I have, how much can I get done, more towards work planning, yeah, so how do I actually distribute the work so they get to maximum done? And this is where agile and lean practices uh, come in very, very handily. It's around pivoting to the workforce you know, to areas um, that might not be in your core competency today, uh, but where you already know you will need to develop those skills within your workforce. And then of course, it's also scaling up the new skills. But this doesn't only mean that you need to upskill your people, this means you need to skill them with the right things. You need to, for example, give them the ability to work with AI-based systems and to be able to work uh, with these little AI assistants and automation and so on. And you need to invest a lot in the automation AI systems themselves. So in summary, before we open for a couple of questions, the workforce of the future, specifically in quality engineering is defined um, by a number of things. Take a look at uh, your organization, your project, uh, the task in front of you, and then do three things. Reimagine the work that you're doing today to um, address uh, the workforce that you have. Pivot your workforce to areas that unlock new value, which means take a look at the roles that you have and uh, make sure your people are actually motivated to go there. And then the, finally, take a look at um, where can I borrow skills when it comes to crowd testing? Where can I bought certain aspects? Where do I need to buy it and where do I build it? Um, and how do I actually do all of these things together? And ultimately, 
focus on your core employees, focus on those people who are most important to you. And these are your employees because without them, you can't get any work done. No bot gets programmed by itself, at least not yet. And uh, take a look at the six individual dimensions to understand what motivates them and how can you get them on this journey. With that, thank you from my side. I'll um, open up so far there haven't been any questions, but um, back to you to see whether anybody has a question for us today. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, yeah, just a reminder that there's still time to ask those questions. Um, Perfect. Um, I have I have a few questions here for you, Mattis, um, at the moment, but if there's still time to get those questions in. Um, so we just reminded that we have our conference next month. We're going to The Hague 12th to the 15th of November. Tickets are still available now. So head over to our Eurostar site if you want to purchase a ticket. So we'll go to questions. Perfect. Um, okay. How do you deal with the business challenge of a shorter time to market? Well, in general, this is not a, a question only for quality engineering. Mm. Yeah, you need to equip uh, your people to be able to deal with that, which means they definitely need to be in the sprints. I've seen a lot of quality organizations that believe they can work completely outside of the sprints, and, and that will not work uh, much longer. You need to be able to deploy your people into the sprint teams, maybe even to loan them to sprint teams. And in some cases, like the banking organization that I mentioned, you need to be be ready to to actually give them back uh, to the business side so that they can work in the sprints. Yeah, that's the, the easiest way of um, making sure this challenge of, of time to market and gets addressed because you can't be the big monolithic test center at the end anymore um, who tests and tests and tests and then you, you cannot speed up. Okay. Will AI evolve quality engineering in such a way that it will be self-managing? Well, I would say rather later than sooner. Mm. Um, if you look at some of the applications of AI, um, this morning, for example, I, I saw an example of, of AI, um, an AI team, a bot who's been learning a, a game called Dota 2, which is quite big in the, in the gaming community. Um, th that bot has been trained for two years, and while they're able to beat 99.9% .9 of, of normal players against real professional players, they'll still lose, and they, they still need a lot to learn. Um, same like you, you might have seen uh, Botnik, uh, which is a, a group of AI scientists who decided to write a new Harry Potter book. Mm. Um, that didn't turn out too well. You're more than welcome to Google it, because one of the first sentences was that uh, Ron saw Harry. He was happily tapping his foot. And then he um, immediately began eating Hermine's uh, family. Um, and, and the book well, goes downhill from there. So, which means um, let's first focus on applying artificial intelligence. Let's okay. make sure we get the bias out of the data that we feed AI with, because that's also a very, very crucial context. And then we can think about self-managing an AI. For now, let's learn how do we use AI to make better quality decisions, uh, to let that guide us, to use little assistance, and then we can build from there. Okay. I suppose it's kind of along the same vein, but what, for the future, do we stop spending money on testing and rather on machine learning and analytics? I would say um, we will probably uh, stop spending um, too much money on manual testing, and, but it's in the same vein of, of automating work. Yes, we will spend a lot more on framework. We will spend a lot more on upskilling our people to be able to create and design a framework instead of you know programming it outright. And uh, the same with bots. So how do you manage a series of bots that all need to interact with one another? That's a key challenge out there right now. And it's a difficult one and somebody needs to figure that out. So no, we will not stop spending money on, on quality, but we'll probably go the into more of the area of, of the manufacturing industry, where instead of testing everything um, over and over again, we focus on the individual components and we use machine learning and we use AI and monitoring and analytics uh, to identify areas. We then probably still need to do that one final test drive. Okay. Um, quality engineering today, we face the challenge of frequently changing requirements. What can you suggest? 
<laughs> um, well, that's a, a testing problem, not so much a quality engineering problem. Um, but one of the key things that uh, we suggest, if you take a look at the, the skills, mm. Um, for many, many years, we focused on building domain knowledge into our testing organizations. And we said, okay, you're a good tester if you really have deep application knowledge. And we, we didn't focus so much on the testing and uh, the process skills or maybe on the technical skills behind that. So when it comes to, to ever-changing requirements, on the one hand, um, it was uh, on one of the slides around the skills yeah, where I talked about prudent risk-taking. We need to equip our quality engineers, our testers, with these skills to identify what's the risk behind that. If you look at TMMI, for example, it always starts with product risk, with product quality risk, identifying what's the inherent risk in this application, then breaking that down to the actual requirement or user story. And those skills um, in test design, how to decide the best path for testing, those skills we really need to increase in our workforce so that they're able to work with that. Because the changing requirement might not be a bad thing. If we don't understand the impact of that changing requirement, then it's definitely a bad thing. And that's what quality engineers need to learn. Okay. How do we keep developer experience relevant across across test environments? Sorry, how do we keep developer experience relevant across, across test, test environments? environments? Well, nothing really rings the bell when I, when I think about developer experience. Um, if this is a question more towards um, the the different areas, the different environments that a developer needs to, to work in, well, that's a challenge for them yeah, because there's, for example, a trend in the industry that you bring your own language, so your own programming language, you bring your own framework. Yeah, so in the future, the world will be even more complex than it is today. Um, if we talk about you know, a certain developer team needing to manage many, many hundreds of test environments because with cloud-based systems, with services virtualization, it's much easier for us to set it up. Well, this is a governance topic. Uh, this is a topic where, again, you as uh, the tester, you as the quality engineer need to be on the one hand self-sustained. And if you have DevOps, uh, it's a very easy thing for them to include that in the pipeline. But probably um, the, the gist of the question was a little bit outside. I don't know whether okay. we can rephrase that. Okay. But there are different topics here. What exactly do you mean by a borderless organization? Can you explain a little more? Sure. Um, borderless is our tagline. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago, we called it a reimagined workforce. Yeah, where typically organizations looked at their own employees and then maybe they, they took some decisions where they said, well, this is not our key competency and therefore we'll buy that from the market. Yeah, we want to um, do a greenfield implementation of Sapana. Obviously, we don't have Sapana skills today, so we'll just buy them and then over time we'll build that. Uh, borderless really means not in the sense of geographic borders. It really means of an organization that takes a look across organizational boundaries, across organizational borders. So who do I have internally, but not only within my IT department, who do I have in the business domains where I could borrow a crowd, for example, do things? What kind of strategic partners do I have, but also then what kind of bots can I program? And that's what we call borderless. So really in the sense of moving away from organizational entities, a lot of big banks are moving within their IT to the Spotify model, mm -hmm. which means they're moving more into guilds and tribes and so on, and then focusing around a business feature instead of being very, very application-centric. And that's an instantiation of a borderless organization right there. Okay. Last question, um, Matthias. Will we need less human tasks and employees with the growth of avatars and AI? Will this have an effect on, on employment in the field? Well, the first thing that we'll see is that task will be shifting. Mm. Um, we, we see that already today. Um, we're, as, as Accenture, we're obviously uh, one of the bigger service providers in the field. We're selling a lot less of manual testing. We're selling a lot more automation architects, uh, agile um, evangelists, or, or people who give a strategic direction, which means we need to upskill and, and change our workforce to move more towards that. Um, and we'll see that shift happening uh, first. Uh, so that we'll have roughly the same employment out there in the testing or quality engineering space, but with different tasks. 
But over time, and time I mean 10, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. I think exactly the same will happen to what happened to the steel industry. We'll have the same output with a lot less people. And uh, hopefully um, that is also due to much better quality being in requirements and in the development space already, which means we actually don't need to do that much testing anymore. So first roles will change, skills will change, we need to adapt to that. And then um, we'll have less need for actual testers. Okay, great. Matthias, thank you for your time today. Um, really interesting webinar. And I'd like to remind everyone that a recording of this webinar will be available over on our Huddle site. So head over there and um, have a listen back. Thank you, Matthias. And thank you to our platinum partner, Accenture. See you next month. Thank you. Thank you.